working okay? Yes. Okay. Um, so where this talk came from, um, I've done different aspects of this topic in sort of guest gigs in different courses. And last semester, Dr. Eckler invited me to come to Women in Society um, to talk about this topic, and it kind of gave me the opportunity to bring all sorts of stories um, together. So that, that's the origin of this. So we're going to be looking at um, women artists, women's art, and feminist art. And I'm going to do this uh, historically, and there's, there's a couple reasons for that. Um, one is that untangling some of these questions and relationships, it's, it's helpful to do it when you're looking historically where we've been, but also because I think we need to look at that to understand where we are now, um, what that, that history was. During the uh, presidential election in philosophy of the arts, we were studying the Harlem Renaissance and reading people like um, Elaine Locke. And it occurred to me after the election, and I told the class this, that 20 years from now, hopefully, I'll still be teaching, but I'm going to be in a room with people who haven't been born yet. And I'll be able to talk about how I participated in electing the first African-American president, and we'll still be watching the video on the Harlem Renaissance. So we talked about why that was important and why that would be, and Rebecca Jarvis said, yeah, but I hope in 20 years you won't have to ask them the same questions you're asking us. And I thought that was really right on. Um, so to get started, um, I'm going to talk about three different levels. The artwork itself, um, the discourse around the work, how it gets talked about, and then the art practice, the practice of the artists and our, our art institutions. So I want to start with um, Linda Knopfler's seminal article, Why Have There Been No Great Women Artists?, which was published in 1971. Uh, the context of this article, Jansen had just done a new edition of his art history text, which is one of those big things that's used in the survey course. And in that text, he included no female artists. And when he was asked why not, he said, quote, there was no woman who was exceptional, exceptional enough to be included in a history of art that was only one volume. So that was 1971. In 2003, there was a six-hour television series on American art. It was done in two-hour segments. In six hours, guess how many women? Three. And the narrator of that program, Robert Hughes, said he included Georgia O'Keeffe only because she was a woman, otherwise he would not have considered her work good enough. <laughs> so, how do we respond to this, why are there been no great women artists? Well, the first kind of response was to take up the challenge of the question and go out and look to see if people could find great women artists. And we found a few. <laughs> Let's see. There we go. Okay, so one of the first people um, that, that was talked about was Armini Genileschi, and this is her self-portrait as Allegory from 1630. And this one is Judith Lane Hall Fairness, and she did uh, several versions of this. At the time, one of the things that she was criticized for were images that were too violent and too aggressive and not befitting a woman. Um, I, however, love the way that Sister Wendy talks about these images. <laughs> Sister Wendy, um, talking about one of these, talks about how practical she is. She's going to take this man's head off. What does she do? She brings her maidservant. She brings a, a basket to put it in. She has all the matters figured out. She's not going to handle a head, and you've got to have some place to put a bloody head. And so Sister Wendy says it's sort of that practically takes the female to think of that practical nature of the situation. <laughs> now, in terms of her own life, as a teenager, she was able to be in her father's atelier, but she was raped at a young age by one of her father's colleagues. She was questioned and tortured by the police to see if she was telling the truth, and he was eventually released from jail about a year later. She was fortunate to be able to go on to learn how to read, attend the academy. She eventually established her own atelier and traveled extensively through Italy and had a fairly autonomous life at that point. Now, the first monograph that was written on her was by Mary Garrard, and she talked about the rape a great deal and how that influenced her, her painting. 
But art historians writing at the time, um, Frank Saskel said that the rape was not relevant to her work. And yet, while he was writing about one of his contemporaries, Testa, he went into great detail about the suicide and how the suicide influenced the work. Now, there are a couple of ways that you could read that. You could read that as a woman's life is not important to be talked about, but a man's life is crucial to what he's doing, or maybe rape just isn't as important an event and to be taken as seriously as suicide. But I think either way, there's a very interesting sort of differential treatment there in, in how they're talked about. So just as a, a comparison here, um, contemporary Titian, The Rape of Europa, gets described by Frederick Hart as uh, heroic. She is distraught, yet yielding. Another person that was revived in the recuperative strategy was Mary Cassatt. Um, this is the caress. The little girl in the blue armchair. Mother nursing her baby, and a cup of tea. Again, in terms of her contemporaries, one of the things that she was criticized for um, was the subject matter. These are domestic scenes. Uh, they're not appropriate for the, the realm of high art. They aren't uh, high enough. Okay, so the recuperative strategy does unearth females that are, are great women artists, but only a handful. So it seems to look like there weren't any. Um, so people began to shift to think about another way to address that question. And maybe what it means is that we have to reshape the question. And that maybe there's a different kind of greatness for women. <clears throat> or maybe they're making a different kind of art. So what would that be like? What would be a woman's art? Well, maybe it's a delicate style or a sub sub subtle color palette. It's a different subject matter or using different materials. If that were possible, that there's a women's art, um, what are the conditions under which that would happen? What, what would bring that about? Um, where would the difference come from, I guess is what I'm asking. To go back to Elaine Locke, in the Harlem Renaissance, he explicitly called for a black idiom. And he was talking about both subject and style. He noticed that there were some distinctions in style and subject matter for what people were doing in the Harlem Renaissance, and he thought that should be embraced and really advocated that African Americans use that style. He agreed with Du Bois that art had an important role to play in social and political change, and that's why he was calling for this. For him, the reason that he thought it was possible was a difference in social condition. It was where people were placed socially that they shared in common. It wasn't a matter of genetics. It wasn't a matter of where you came from or some different kind of inborn talent. But they shared a similar social condition. So could the same thing be true for women, that they're in a similar social position, and that leads them to have similar interests, uh, similar concerns, and thus use a similar expressive style? <coughs> I think we can talk about or recognize a feminine or masculine style. You might think that the, the swirling curves of Fragonard are feminine. Um, in this painting, we've got a, a domestic scene, a very delicate color palette, sort of gentle brush strokes, but it's a Pierre Bonnard. This might be a more masculine style, more aggressive, bolder co color palette. But this one is Sheila Elias from 1983. I think the difference between calling for a black idiom and talking about women's, women's art is that Locke was talking about a specific time period in a specific community, and he was calling for political and social change. I think it would be much harder to see that kind of thing across all of history for women in, in all different cultures. There are more likely females to have um, traits in common with their contemporaries, I think, than with other women artists. Mary Passat, certainly, when you look at her style, is much more has much more in common with her contemporaries than she does even with our music. <coughs> There's also, um, I think, a danger 
and setting up an idea that there's a women's art or a different sense of greatness. And uh, in a nutshell, I'm going to quote from Hans Hildebrandt, who's a Bauhaus art historian. The fundamental characteristic of female creativity is already evident in childhood. The delight in color, the striving for pleasing effect, orderliness and smallness, the inferior talent for spatial representation, playfulness instead of overall planning, the tendency for the superfluous. <laughs> because as soon as you set up an other, um, you're setting up a hierarchy and you're going to ghettoize the work. So I think that there are both empirical and theoretical reasons for not establishing a different category or a different sense of grace, uh, greatness. So for the third response, um, I want to look at what Nochlin says about why there have been no great women artists. She says that we really have to examine the assumptions that are packed into the question. And one of the assumptions is what we think an artist is and how one becomes an art. That people are operating or were operating under the assumption of the artist as genius. That this is an inborn talent, you've either got it or you don't. <coughs> so if women haven't shown it, then they just don't have it. But she doesn't think that this is the way we should think about what artists are. So I'm going to quote from Nachlin. The problem has been with the misconception of what art is, with the naive idea that art is the direct, personal expression of individual, emotional, or experience, a translation of personal life into visual terms. Art is almost never that. Great art, certainly never. The making of art involves a self-consistent language of forms, more or less dependent upon or free from given temporally defined conventions, schemata, or systems of notation, which have to be learned or worked out either through teaching apprenticeship or a long period of, exper of individual experimentation. So what conditions have to be present to allow one to pursue art as a career? Well, it's helpful to be in the correct social class. Um, you have to have familial support and encouragement, some kind of reward. The demands and expectations on your life can't be too great to preclude your pursuing this. And most importantly for her, educational facilities. So she locates it, the problem, in our social institutions. <coughs> you look back to Jen Gillespie, what did she have? She was in an appropriate social class, she had a father's support, she had economic support, and eventually an education. So she kind of fits in there. So Malcolm concludes, the fault is not in our stars, our hormones, our menstrual cycles, our empty internal spaces, but are in our institutions and our education. The miracle is, in fact, that given the overwhelming odds against women, so many have managed to achieve so much in the valuates of masculine prerogative like science, politics, or the arts. So this leads me, leads me to the question, um, is Nachlin's question just an historical one? Is it no longer relevant? Or is it one that we should still be asking? So to um, begin to address that, I want to shift to the artists in the 70s when this article was, was produced and shift to looking at feminism and, and feminist art. Still talking about the three, the three levels of the artwork, the discourse around it, and the, the institution. But to begin with, I want to give you um, what I think is the best definition of feminism that I've ever found, which is from um, Alison Jagger, who's a political philosopher. And she says that feminists are all those who seek, no matter on what grounds, to end women's subordination no matter on what grounds, to end women's subordination. Now, the <coughs> of feminism certainly traces back much further, but the, the word first appears in France in the 19th century. And there it was used to refer to the women's movement, which were all those people who were advancing the position of women. In the United States, it at first appears in the early 20th century, and it's associated with sexual romanticism. That being the idea that there's something special about women. There's something mystical about um, the experience of motherhood. Women have a special purity. Um, and in virtue of the specialness, they ought to be treated well, and treated in a certain way. As distinct from sexual, romantic, uh, sexual rationalism, 
which focused on the sameness between males and females in virtue of their reason and argued for equality on that basis. And we're going to see both of these strands um, in the work. Okay. So th uh, this is Titian. Um, but we're all familiar with the reclining nudes, the tradition of the reclining nude, and the discourse around that in terms of women being treated as the object of the gaze, uh, ownership, and, and voyeurism. But in 1914, Mary Richardson, who was a Canadian, and she was a suffragette who was active in the, in the UK, she went by the alias Polly Dick. And in 1914, she went to the Gallery of London and took an axe to Velasquez's Venus. <laughs> the reason that she do, did that is because images are powerful. Um, what we see in images affect how we think about real people and, and real things in the world. So one of the first strategies for feminists was to try and change the way women are represented through representing themselves. In the 70s, there's a real strong current of <coughs> that there, there is an essential nature to being female that all females have in common. It's different than what males have, and the idea was to celebrate that difference, embrace that difference. So this is uh, Joan Semmel, Me Without Mirrors, and one of the, the striking things about this is that you notice where your point of view is, you're looking from where the artist is looking at her own body. You are in her position. This one is called Intimacy Autonomy from 1974. Um, the nude male and female together, and yet the two bodies are not touching. Again, you don't have the, ha the head, you don't have an object of the, the gaze. Yeah. Um, Yolanda Lopez, this is a self-portrait the idea of the goddess was very prevalent. Again, you know, you embrace those things that are, are strong about females. This is an Audrey Flack. Um, she made these statues any size from, you know, dashboard size to <coughs> huge monuments. And she used her friends, she used sort of, you know, women of all different shapes and sizes to create these different, different goddesses. Uh, and this is a Cynthia Mailman. Okay, so I want to talk a little bit about cunt art. Um, cunt art was a term that was used in the 70s for art about the female body. Not always literally focusing on the genitalia, but using also metaphors for it. But um, I want to go to a predecessor to that, since I mentioned it at the beginning, Giorgio. <coughs> Okay, so I'm talking about her as a predecessor to this art. Now, of course, the way that she talked about her work was not that at all. She said she was painting flowers. And in fact, she said, quote, I hate flowers. I hate them because they're cheaper than models and they don't move. <laughs> <laughs> so the way that I'm talking about the work is on a different, different level, but I think you can read the work that, that way and put it in a feminist light. Okay, so the um, cunt art went well beyond the 70s. And part of the, the idea of talking about this was embracing that, that term and taking sort of the most despicable term that you could call a female and trying to take it back in order to empower people. Because when you're talking about like the woman problem as, or the black problem or the poverty <coughs> problem, that's something that serves the, those in power, right? The interests of those in power. What does it take to change that? Well, unfortunately, the people who are the problem often have to change that. And one way to change it is to, um, to try and shift how you're viewed. So the, the, the backdrop for this, you have to remember in the 1960s, is all of the liberation movements, right? Gay liberation, black liberation, women's liberation. And the, the language shifts from terms of rights and equality to um, oppression and liberation. Because people realized that you could point to all kinds of ways that there was equality, and still things weren't quite right yet. So what is the problem? Well, 
it has to do with other things like opportunities, prejudices, attitudes. And images can be very effective in, in affecting those things. Okay, so this is uh, Nancy Sparrow's The Chorus Line. Oh, missed one. Let me see if it'll go back. Yes, okay. Okay, so Hannah Wilkie, this one is from the 1960s, the uh, teasel cushion, where she uses a lot of this organic imagery that relates to the, the body and the, these, folded, um, these folded forms. This is a, a pin cushion flower, the, the U.S. name for it, and it has sharp prongs on it, and it's used in the textile industry to uh, raise nap on, on wool. That's needed erasers on a postcard, and that's also um, Hannah Wilkie. And she said, you can say Gothic church is a phallic symbol, but if I say the name of the church is a really big vagina, people are offended. Okay, so we're going to come back to her. This is Fight Back by Jennifer Pepper, the company's <coughs> And, of course, if we're going to talk about punk art, we have to talk about the Judy Chicago's dinner party. Um, this is an installation shot, and that's what the layout, or layout was, is. Um, she celebrates over 1,000 women innovators in, in this piece. And there are um, dinner table settings with ceramic plates. This one is Mary Wollstone Crafts. That's her plate and her placemat. Emily Dickinson. And Artemisia Genileski. Now, using the, the dinner table and the idea of a, a dinner table brings that, that realm of females of you know eating, preparing food, the, the dinner table setting is also a way to celebrate that in addition to celebrating all these women. Also using um, techniques like embroidery, which are tr traditionally women's work. Um, it was unveiled in 1979 in San Francisco and was supposed to go on a national tour, but that got um, canceled. It lived most of its life in storage until 2002 when the Elizabeth R. Sackler Foundation acquired <coughs> donated it to the Brooklyn Museum where it now has a permanent home. So one of the things that has shifted in the art world in terms of the institutions is that there are now some women who are in positions of power and money in order to purchase the work. So Judy Chicago states, um, one of the big changes is that finally a woman has come forward to provide patronage for another woman's work on a level from which women had formerly been restricted. So much work by women has been erased because we have not had comparable patronage. Okay, so I want to shift to um, the next decade, the 1980s. In the 1980s, um, the strong strand of essentialism is no longer there, and we're really moving more towards deconstruction. And many female artists are working on trying to undermine, question the definition of male, female, masculine, feminine, and how all those things are related to each other. Um, this is a, a Cindy Sherman. And she did a whole, I just brought images from one, one series. This one series that she did where she dressed herself up in different costumes to look like paintings by masters such as Goya, um, Holbein, and, and Titian, and Raphael. Really talking about sort of female stereotypes in the way that they have been depicted through art history. And it's interesting, she talks about these and says that she really feels like she's anonymous in these because there's this layering that goes on and it's revealing and, and concealing where, where is she in, in this photograph. So I think it comments both on art history but also on gender and the way people have been presented. I've read a couple of interviews with her from her um, where she says she's not a feminist and I'm not quite sure what that's about in the way she talks about her work. Okay, so 
So there are um, a lot of work in the 1980s that involves text. And the, the text is used um, very often in combination with images to make the text read differently or make the images work differently in these different juxtapositions. I think Nancy Sparrow is a good example of this. This is from um, Notes in Time on Women. Um, and this is an installation shot of it. You can see there's kind of like three <coughs> strands there. And it runs around three walls of the gallery. And what's on it is images that she's taken from art history, from the newspaper, the quotations from all different places. And she puts them again in like new relationships to each other. Then you as the viewer, when you come in, you're reconstructing another story too. Because the scroll doesn't have to go from beginning to end. You can enter it anywhere and start to, to build the story of what she's talking about. So that's a close-up um, of the image, of some of the images. And she very purposely uses images of women from all different points in history and all different body types. You know, there's pregnant women running across the walls, um, talking about like strength and ability um, <coughs> and expectations. Okay, there we go. Okay, so this is a quote from Derrida. There is no essence of women. There is no truth about women. Feminists are men. Feminism, indeed, is the operation by which woman wants to come to resemble man, a whole virile illusion. Feminism wants castration, even that of woman. Now you take that quotation and you have this woman leaping over it. It begins to read very and function very differently than it does in the original text. So Barbara Kruger, of course, uses a lot of text. She says, we are obliged to steal language, and we have been able to do so. When I hear the word culture, I take out my checkbook. <laughs> One of the things that her texts do, though, is that they implicate the viewer in always using the um, we, them, I, you, what the viewer has to decide is where to align oneself. Are you the one being talked about, or are you the one talking? That is on the um, entrance to the gallery. Why are you here? I want to go back to, to Hannah Wilkie and talk a little bit about the discourse around her work. Um, this is her with the Ponderosa series from 1976. Now, she also played with words and putting images and text together to make them operate in a different way. She often used her own body, uh, nude, in her work. This was uh, C'est La Vie, it's a video still from 1976, in which she reenacted Duchamp's famous chess game, though Duchamp played with a nude model, and here the artist is nude playing chess, inverting the situation. And this is from one of her exhibition announcements. Now, she received a lot of criticism for using her body in her work. Um, that by doing that, what she was doing was underscoring instead of undermining the idea <coughs> of women as object. However, her mother, who's on the right, Thelma, um, had breast cancer and died from it. And Hannah Wilkie later developed breast cancer and she too died from it. But during the time that she was sick, she continued to photograph herself throughout the illness. And she did that partly as a means of trying to keep some control. When you are a patient, you are completely at a loss of, of power. And this was one way for her to, to maintain some control over herself. And these are the, the hair drawings. Each one is made from the hair that fell out in one day during her chemotherapy.
So I think it's interesting the way um, the discourse about her work shifted because at this point people said that it was now appropriate for her to use her body, her body and her work. Um, and Estelle Water points out that if you think about her practice as an artist, that using the art in a therapeutic way is can even be a sort of a feminist intervention to use the art for that purpose rather than just <coughs> an aesthetic one. Okay, so I put this one in here just for fun. I found this gym in the slide library. Um, this is from a 19th century popular French magazine. And that's London off once. <laughs> it's called uh, Buy My Bananas. <laughs> Okay, so the last set of uh, images here are from the Gorilla Girls. These are posters from 1985 to 1994. The advantages of being a woman artist, working without the pressure of success, not having to have shows with men, being included in revised versions of art history, getting your picture in the art magazine wearing a gorilla suit. <laughs> Uh, these letters um, they actually sent to collectors after looking at their collections and, and seeing what they held in them. Um, sent them and, and asked them to rectify the situation immediately. <laughs> Which art magazine was worse for women last year? Flash <clears throat> Art, 13%. Women in America earn only two-thirds of what men do. Women artists earn only one-third of what men artists do. But it's even worse in Europe. <laughs> okay, so uh, those are older posters. Where are we now? Um, in 1989, they produced a poster, Do <coughs> Have to Be Naked to Get into the Met Museum? Less than 5% of the artists in the modern art section are women, but 85% of the nudes are female. When they reissued it in 2005 and updated the information, less than 3% of the artists in the modern art section are women, but 83% of the nudes are female. So some of the, the good news. Um, in 2007, there was a two-day symposium at MoMA, MoMA called The Feminist Future. And people like Linda Nocklin and Lucy Lepard were there. The Gorilla Girls, two people came as, as their Gorilla Girl counterparts. Um, and that really spawned a, a lot of, of literature, talking, and, and interest in, in feminism. In 2007, the Los Angeles Museum of Contemporary Art did a retrospective of 70s feminist art, which then traveled to the National Museum of Women in Washington, D.C., and to P.S. Warren. Um, the Elizabeth A. Sackler Center for Feminist Art in, Brooklyn, in the Brooklyn Museum is the first permanent space for feminist work, and that was opened in 2007. And there have been major retrospectives over the past couple of years for Elizabeth Murray, Keith Smith, Lorna Simpson, Eva Hess, Louise Nelson, and places like um, the Whitney and, and Moment. <laughs> In um, other news, the Tate Modern in London, 12% of the collection is female. The Turner Prize in Britain, which is one of the most prestigious and remunerative prizes for contemporary art, in the last 20 years was given to two women. The Venus, Venus, the, the Venice Biennale in 2007, 38% female. The Pompidou in Paris recently had an exhibition called Dionysius, 98% male. The cult of women, 98% male. In Fortune 500 companies, we have 16% female corporate officers. And in 2005, when a survey of 125 top galleries in New York City um, were looked at for their fall schedules, there were 297 one-person shows. 23% were solos by women. In MoMA, in their permanent collection from 1879 to 1969, 5% is female artists. So um, I want to close with a, a comment from Kathy Collitz. There is a real acknowledgement among artists, academics, and students that feminism changed art. But the question is, what is the feminist future? Where do we go from here? Thank you.